around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. David Langford here today, and we'd like to welcome you to The Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. Today is Monday. It is January the 30th, 2023. I trust and I pray that your life has been transformed by the quickening power of the Holy Ghost of God and by his most precious word. The coming days are going to be very tenuous. The coming days are going to be more uncertain. But that's why we put our faith in Christ. The Apostle Paul said in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord, and I change not. God is not going to oscillate and vacillate and change with the world. It is the doctrine of immutability, meaning God cannot change. I made a statement here in the Scriptures on this new series, Rediscovering the Word of God, uh, several programs back, and I was questioning, and I, I may have uh, said it in a way that caused question or not said it correctly, but I was trying to find out, was Hilka, the high priest, and 2 Kings 22 and 4, and Hilka and Jeremiah 1 and 1, were they the same priest? Because as I have been sharing with you, these prophets and times overlapped. They overlapped. And through my study and research, I have been unable to determine if Hilkah in 2 Kings 22 and verse 4, the high priest, and then the priest, it says, in Jeremiah 1 and 1, were they the same priest? So if you have greater time and research than I to exhaust that and seek that out, I would be appreciative for what you might be able to find and to share with me. I spend a lot of time studying, a lot of time praying, trying to get down to the truthfulness and the facts of the Word of God, and sometimes I am limited in that. But if you can Discover yourself, the high priest here in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 4, and Hilkiah, the, the, the high priest in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1. I believe it is the same priest, but I can't make a definite determination. And uh, uh, Brother Gary out in Arizona uh, sent me an email, and I think he may have misunderstood the question with uh, Hezekiah and Hilkiah but I'm looking for the same man. Is it the same man in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 4, and, of course, in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1? Let me make mention quickly uh, the DVDs for the Revival Conference are available for a love gift of $55. That's postage included. I know they'll bless your heart and life immensely. Brother Jimmy D. preached one of the most powerful sermons on synchronicity how God synchronizes everything at a particular time and particular purpose. And uh, that was one of the most powerful messages I have ever heard, and I've heard a lot of preachers preach in my 45 years as a minister. I've heard a lot of great preachers, but I'll tell you, when the anointing of the Holy Ghost of God gets on a man and on the message, it is like none other. Don't ever question the Holy Ghost always, always makes a difference. If the Holy Ghost is on a song, a message, the messenger, a musician, a singer, a teacher, it is like none other. That's what makes the difference because the Holy Ghost is the difference maker. And when you have that in your life, you also become a difference maker 
among those that are around you. I want to play a song today, We Shall Behold Him by the Collinsworth family. The song was written by Dottie Rambo, who's gone on to be with the Lord. Dottie wrote so many, many songs, and they were powerfully anointed. And I want to share this song because I want to, I want to encourage you today. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. He will come again. It's not too far out there in the distant future. He's coming back. And all the stage and everything is being put together and assembled for that second great advent of Christ our Lord. And I believe this song will bless you. It's just tremendously musical on the front end of it by the mother of this family, the Collinsworth family. I hope it'll bless your heart. And I pray that it will stir you to get your thoughts and your minds on the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus will come again. Matthew 24, 44, Therefore be also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Jesus is coming. He's going to come when the world will have no clue, no discernment, No way will they be looking for him. And this, my friend, according to Titus 2.11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live righteously and holy and godly, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Christ Jesus. Jesus will come again. And if you believe that, you will live accordingly. I'm reminded of the words of the Apostle John. 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he, Christ, is pure. Let me remind you of Matthew 5 and verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If your heart is pure, your hands are clean, when Christ returns in that great day, the second advent of Christ, you, my friend, will also be a partaker in his second coming. We will behold the Lord in all of his glory. Colossians 3, 4 says, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you appear also with him and glory. Romans 8:18 8, says for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time is not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. You my friend are going to be a participant as well as a recipient of that great 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 glory of almighty God. Thus Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, he said, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange or foreign thing has happened unto you. But rejoice, for inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. You don't hear preachers preach much about being a partaker and a recipient of Christ's sufferings. Let me sum it up in this statement. No cross, no glory. No cross, no glory. Bear your cross, You will be a partaker and a recipient of his glory when he comes, amen. We have so much to look forward to. 
We have so much to embrace. And I want to encourage you before we begin today to make an honest, heartfelt drive to prayer. The last six or seven weeks, I've been trying to sequester myself with God. And I'm confident the only way that we're going to truly make a difference in America and the world is by our prayer lives. If you are not praying faithfully, loyally to Christ, you're failing him. You're failing him. You're failing the church. You're failing your family. You're failing America. America is racing to the bottom of the dregs and the barrel of filth. There is much sin, evil, and wickedness in America, our government, all three branches of government, executive, judicial, legislative branches are corrupt as hell. This nation is so sullied, so sold, and so debased, it begs description. The only way, and I'm, I'm confident in this, the only way this nation will ever remotely have an opportunity or chance to turn is based on our prayer lives. Jesus said when he returns, it would be as it were in the days of Lot, according to Luke chapter 17. In the days of Lot, ten righteous could not be found in the twin cities. Ten. They did not exist. They were not there. I'm confident many of you listening to this broadcast are dedicated, consecrated, separated Christians unto the Lord God of Israel. I'm confident of that. Thousands of you listening, whether it's through radio, television, internet, whatever the case, the scenario, you are a godly person. You live right. No, you're not perfect, neither am I. But we strive to inherit the kingdom of God. We labor, we agonize, we, we press to live a godly, righteous life so that in the end we may hear the Lord say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now there's a lot of people out here who live like hell and will tell you they're Christians. That's a falsehood, that is a fallacy. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot work both sides of the street. You're either in or you're out. John 8, 34, verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. What that means is those who live a life of sin are servants of sin. So you serve the devil and not Jesus Christ. We've all missed the mark. We've all missed the bullseye because we are fallible. We have propensities, we have proclivities, we have tendencies that go against God and cultivate the flesh. But we don't live lives of sin. I hear people say, well, we're all sinners saved by grace. I'm not a sinner. I was before I 
came back to the Lord. Now that I'm a Christian, I'm reconciled with God, I am not a sinner. Quit saying you're a sinner. Quit confessing you sin all the time. Quit confessing you live a life of sin. That's fallacy. That is heresy. That is a mendacity. Sinners, first of all, are those who have no relationship with God. We were all sinners. I was a sinner. I accepted Christ in my life at 12 years of age. In my latter teen years, I departed. I got away from God. So I became a backslider. I slid backward away from God. I couldn't be born again. Like Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't be born again multiple times, but you can backslide and be out of relationship and fellowship with Christ. When you come back, you might say you were reclaimed, redeemed, bought back. But you had been born again, but you drifted back into sin, and you begin to live a life of sin, and sinners do not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Paul said, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If you live a life of unrighteousness, you're not going to inherit heaven. You can believe all this garbage you want to. I read the other day on the Drudge Report a priest who said he went to hell. And he talked about all the good things he had done in his life. He was angry at God. Why am I here? And what he said smote my own heart. God said, you're here because of unforgiveness. And he heard the popular tunes of much music, worldly, secular music in hell. He observed those who had chokers around their necks and chains on the choker, and the demons were leading people around like dogs. Because Satan was their master. We have Japanese Akitas, very loyal dogs, big dogs. But they listen to me because I'm the master. Remember, Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. Either he will love the one and hate the other, else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Do you despise the devil? I hope you do. Do you despise sin? I pray you do. Jesus said, you'll either hold on to one and despise the other. There is such a pathetic teaching and preaching today that it begs description. God has been dealing with me the last several months about many, many things. And I suppose it began in the 80s when people, so-called preachers, ministers, began to change the gospel of Christ. They quit preaching Calvary. They quit preaching the blood. They quit preaching the cross. They begin to preach sociology and psychology and and things of that nature, human behavior, self-esteem, self-confidence, et cetera, et cetera, all of the garbage of the world. And so they quit preaching the gospel. And you know why? They quit, and you know why they still will not preach the gospel? Because they are ashamed of the gospel of Christ. They are absolutely, utterly ashamed of the infallible, immutable word of Almighty God. They are ashamed to preach the truth of the gospel. Romans 1.16, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, For it is the power of God unto salvation. These men are ashamed to preach to you the truth of God's word. 
preaching the truth will get you in trouble. Why? It mainly gets you in trouble with the religious crowd. I had a gentleman phone the other day who saw the telecast. He said, I was so convicted, smitten, because of my sins. He said, because I, after having listened to you, I, I'm not living right. I'm living a life of sin. You see, the word of God does bring results. I know the voice of evangelism is making an impact in the earth. People are turning to Christ. People are repenting. It's not David Lankford, God forbid. It's the word of God and the convicting power of the Holy Spirit of God. These men that claim to be preachers are truly ashamed of the gospel of Christ. They don't preach against sin. God forbid they ever say sin in the pulpit. God forbid they identify adultery, homosexuality, fornication, drunkenness, drugs, alcohol, gambling, lying, cheating. They're not going to say anything about anything because if they do, you might feel bad. These limp-wristed, panty-waist preachers aren't worth the salt in their bread. That may offend some of you. But it's the truth. I was thinking the other day about Paul the Apostle, John the Baptist. John the Baptist was beheaded. Why was John the Baptist beheaded? When he stood before Herod, he said, Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Philip, you know, your brother Philip, you took his wife. Now you're living in adultery. It's not lawful. How many preachers today, if a congressman, a senator, a mayor, a governor would come to their church, would a man preach against sin? Oh, no, I don't want to offend him. So you let him die and go to hell. You see, because John preached the truth, that blood of Herod and Herodias and Salome will not be on John's hands because he told them the truth. I suppose this preaching today is a little bit stout, if I must say so myself. Then I thought about Paul the Apostle and his diplomacy. Not quite as crude, not quite as rude as John the Baptist. But nevertheless, with a little more eloquence and diplomacy, Paul the Apostle preached to Felix and Drusilla. Felix was a governor appointed by the Roman Empire. Drusilla was his wife, according to the scriptures, but she was previously married to another king. Some theologians believe that the sorcerer, Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8, was paid by Felix to put a spell on Drusilla that she would leave her husband and come and abide and abode with Felix. So in Acts chapter 24, beginning at verse 24, we see this and we see what you might deem a measure of diplomacy and how Paul preached to Felix. Acts 20, 24. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewish, see, she knew about the Mosaic law and she knew about adultery. Felix sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And it says in verse 25, and as he reasoned or as he preached, and he preached three things, righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. 
Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Now, Paul the Apostle was not quite as pointed as John the Baptist to Herod and Herodias and Salome. But Paul was somewhat more diplomatic, but he still preached what John the Baptist preached, and that was righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Number one, he preached righteousness. What was he saying? Felix, Drusilla, God demands that you do the right thing. You must live a righteous and a godly life. You must lay aside the weights. You must lay aside the sins. You must live your life according to the word of God. Secondly, Paul preached temperance. Look that up in the Greek. It's 1466 in the Strong Exhaustive Concordance. Temperance. Temperance about what? Your unbridled lust, Felix, for Drusilla. And vice versa, Drusilla. Your drinking, your mannerisms, your lying, your cheating, all the ungodly things that you do, temperance. So Paul preached against sin when he preached temperance. And again, Acts 24, 25, and as he reasoned, and look up the word reason there if you desire, it means as he preached, as he ministered. And the third one was, and judgment to come. Judgment to come. What? Paul told Felix, the governor, Drusilla, his wife, you're going to stand before the judgment of God Almighty one day? Yes, Paul preached that. Judgment to come. Revelation 22, 12, behold, I come quickly, my reward is with me, to give every man according as his works shall be. The more I study the Bible, the judgment seat of Christ will be here on the earth. That is Matthew 25, when he separates the sheep and the goats. We're all going to stand there. You'll be judged for your Good works as a righteous person, not for works of evil, but works of righteousness because you were devout. You serve the Lord. The wicked, the sinner, they're going to be judged for their evil works, their evil deeds, their evil lifestyle. He will say to the sheep, go to my right hand. The goats, go to my left hand. And they'll be sentenced and damned to eternal destruction apart from God Almighty. So the Apostle Paul preached to Felix and Drusilla, righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Romans 14, 11 says, It is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow unto me, every tongue shall confess unto God, so then every one of us shall give account of himself unto God. You may think you're not going to give an account. You will. You will give an account. I will give an account. We all will give account of our lives. And the account will be accurate. It won't be uh, doctored. It won't be manipulated. It won't be uh, messed with because we're going to give that accurate account. See? So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, and 11. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. What was John the Baptist doing to Herod and Herodias? Salome, trying to persuade them. 
What was the Apostle Paul doing to Felix and Drusilla, trying to persuade them? What do I do when I preach uncompromisingly the word of Almighty God? I'm trying to persuade you. Why persuade you for the judgment that is to come? You will not postpone your court date. We all will give an accurate account of our lives to Christ. Those who are washed in the blood will not be judged for sin. You'll be judged according to your righteous work and what you've done for God and his kingdom in his service. The sinner, (laughs) they'll have no works of righteousness. You only have righteous works because you are saved. Righteous works do not save you. I just quoted that from Titus 2.11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Christ Jesus. That's the grace of God that suffers, allows you to do righteous works, Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he hath saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Righteous works do not save you. You have righteous works because you are saved. Herod and Herodias had no righteous works. Look how evil her works were. When Salome danced before Herod in that drunken party, it says that her dance pleased Herod. I'll leave it at that. Pleased Herod. Being inebriated and drunk, stirred by her vulgar dance, he makes an oath before his lords and captains. All of his guests, I'll give you half of my kingdom. What do you want? She said, hey, just give me a minute. Let me go talk to mama. And Salome goes to Herodias. She said, what do I ask Herod for? She said, John the Baptist had on a charger, a wooden platter. That's what we want. See, she will stand before God Almighty. And God will record or play back what she said, what she did. One of the early fathers in the church said she pulled John's tongue out of his skull and stretched it and drove a dagger through it. It might have been Tertullian. I can't remember which early church father said she did that. She stuck a a dagger through John the Baptist's tongue. (laughs) You know what she was saying? I got you, buddy, and your tongue will never preach righteousness, temperance, or judgment to me ever again. And you know what, Herodias? You're right. John the Baptist will never preach that again to you, but that does not nullify you one day standing before the judgment seat of God Almighty. Preachers are ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Well, I can't preach that. It, that might offend someone. You know, I, I, the mayor of my city, he attends my church like Joy Osteen. He went to the mayor's lesbian wedding. Instead of telling her, hey, hey, you're going to stand before the judgment seat of God. That's not right. You need to live a righteous life. You need to bridle your temperance because you will stand in judgment before God. But you see, that that kind of preaching is, is not popular. Most preachers 50 years ago could, could not find a church to let them preach today. They just wouldn't have it just won't have it. 
But see, when you know the scriptures, when you know the word of God, the word of God demands righteousness, temperance, and makes you sober to the fact, judgment to come. This is what happened to Josiah here in 2 Kings 22. You see, God suffers all men to have an encounter with him. I was in prayer the other morning, and I was stirred when the scripture came back to my mind, 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants all men to be saved, period. The profuse, marring, mutilating, eviscerating of the body of Christ was for everyone. Not for the Jews only, but for the Gentiles. I was reading again the other day in the ninth chapter of John how the man that was born blind, Jesus healed him. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, they, the, 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 the elders said, you can't come back into the synagogue. So that's why Christianity, they begin to have meetings outside of the synagogues. So that cast away, casting out Christians, people who believed in Jesus the Messiah, they said, you can't fellowship with us no more. See, today it's the exact opposite. And that you and I are told, you can't fellowship with us. You're too conservative. You're too straight. You have too much conviction. We don't want you in our church. You don't belong here. See, we like to drink our wine. We like to smoke our dope. We like to drink our liquor. We like to watch our pornography. We like to go to homosexual weddings. We like to fornicate. We like to commit adultery. We believe sodomy is all right. We, we, we want to do all these things. Don't you come to our church. And so what is happening? Revelation 18, 4 is being fulfilled. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partaker of her plagues. The Methodist denomination is in the throes of turmoil right now. I know a lady that goes to a Methodist church in Lincolnton, North Carolina, They voted, I think it was two weeks ago this past Sunday, whether to leave the Methodist denomination or stay. And the vote was 57 to 12. 57 said, let's leave. 12 said, let's stay. I question the idiocy of the 12. Why do you want to stay in a harlot church? Come out of her, my people. See, I'm sure many of the Methodists knowing that they are elementary in the scriptures, don't realize, but by coming out, they're fulfilling Revelation 18, 4. Come out of her, my people. They're God's people, but they're in a harlot church. God says, come out, come out. And of course, nationwide, it's been a catastrophe But that was the revelation God gave me 25 plus years ago, Acts chapter 27, the storm Eurocladon. Churches, denominations are going to fail and fall like flies. Why? Because they're all become corrupt for the most part. Whether it's sin or politics, politics in church is a sin. Shouldn't be like that. God theocracy. God should rule. His word should rule and dictate what a church says they're going to do or not to do. And because there's so much sodomy, homosexuality, and the Methodist denomination, there's a faction that stood up and said, no, we don't want this. And there are those who said, that's what we want. We want the homosexuality. We want the, the liberty to sin. We want to be like the libertines community, wives, sex, whatever, all this filth and degradation, debasedness. It is sad, it is tragic. 
But this is what's happening to the modern church today. And Isaiah 50 Eight, one says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their iniquities. Nobody wants to talk about sin. Nobody wants to tell people you're a sinner and you're lost without God. But Jesus, through the precious blood of the Lamb, has made provision to atone for your sin and you can be in fellowship with God in the right way. Oh, that, we, we don't want to hear that. We just want you to feel good. I'll get back into Josiah tomorrow. Obviously, I've not done a good job in getting there today. But when Josiah heard the word of God, his heart was smitten. You you wonder why I preach the Bible like I do. Because Jesus said in Matthew 24, heaven, 24, 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. God's word is forever settled in heaven. It will never be done away with. Never. Never done away with. And yet, you go to most nominal churches, they don't even talk about the Word of God. They don't care about the Word of God. Your heart should be enamored with the Word of God. People today that are professing Christians don't have any idea of the gravity of God and what God's Word says. We need the entirety of God's counsel preached, the good and the bad. None of it's bad. But the world will say, well, that, that, that's bad preaching. Don't, don't preach on fornication. Don't, don't preach on adultery. Don't, don't preach on same-sex marriage. Why not? It's in the Bible. God is against it. God's word says that's wrong, that's evil, that is sin. God's word says that will separate you from me and you'll spend eternity lost and damned without me. See, it's, it's, it's Burger King. Going to have it your way. But that's not true. You cannot have it your way, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. See, this is why we have so many denominations and so many organizations. People are looking for a church to fit their fancy. Well, I can go over here and, and, and be a lesbian, and they tell me I'm, I'm, I'm justified by the blood. I'm, I'm going to heaven. No, they may tell you that, but that's a lie. They'll tell you anything you want to hear to get a number. This is why the Methodist denomination is in such turmoil because, you see, the governmental structure of the denomination says that the denomination owns all church property. The local congregation buys it, pays for it, but the denomination says, we own it, somewhat like the Catholic Church. And they're now having to relinquish these properties back to the local congregants. And that means their portfolio of wealth is diminishing profusely. So now they're selling churches left and right. The Methodist denomination is repurposing churches from a church to a office building, from a church to this, from a church to that, wherein they can make money. Oh, there we go. I finally said it, didn't I? It's all about money. Yeah. 1 Timothy 6.10. The love of money is the root of all evil. 
which while some have coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You know, men never think about standing before the judgment seat of God where they took widow's might. Widow women who are on a fixed social security income, that's all they have. And they shake these elderly people down and they take the money and they drive this and they drive that and they they fly this jet and that jet and they do this and they do that. I will not go there. I will not live that because I know I'm going to stand before God Almighty. People who give to the voice of evangelism give because they love the Lord and they love the word that we proclaim. God doesn't shake people down. Luke 6, 38, give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosoms. I believe in giving. I believe in tithing. I believe in all the right things. And I do that not because I'm asked to do it. I do that because I love God. I'm glad I can bless other people. I'm glad I can bless other people. I'm glad to be a blessing. Some of you listening are the greatest blessing to us, and I probably don't tell you enough. But I do try to send you a thank you note and thank you for what you do because I realize you can put your money anywhere you want, but you love the Lord, you love his word, you love the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, and you say, you know, I want to support that. I want to, I want to be a part of that. I, I, I am a man that fears God. I fear him. That's why I'm constrained to preach the word of God without compromise, which shows me other men, they have no fear of God. If they said, hey, I'm a God-called, God-ordained preacher, then why don't you preach all the gospel? Why don't you declare truth and righteousness and temperance instead of patty-caking the message and pampering and protecting people from the real truth? There's going to be a lot of upheaval in America in this year. 2023, 20 means redemption, 23 means death. There's going to be a measure of redemption in certain areas of this nation. There are going to be revelations. There's going to be a limited restoration and some constitutional aspects. Then 23 meaning death, there are going to be the death of other things. There are going to be death of some freedoms. They're going to be death of politicians, both physical and spiritual. Other leaders, there'll be physical death, both physical and spiritual. This is going to be a year that's dangerous. <clears throat> I was thinking about what Jesus said the other day. You need to be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. You need to prepare for famine, food shortages. Well, why would you say that? Because Jesus tells us in his word, there are going to be famines. If he tells you that, don't you think you should do something about it? Don't you think you should be a wise virgin and do the right thing? You see, the foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. They knew the bridegroom was coming. They just did not long know how long it would take before he got there. So that's why the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Read Matthew 25. They were all virgins. They all slumbered. They all slept together. But the difference was made manifest when the cry was made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. The Greek says going out. 
But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. But he said, Depart. I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Wherein the Son of Man cometh. They that were ready. What a profound statement. They that were ready. Are you ready? You see, the foolish virgins thought they were ready. But thinking you're ready and being ready is two different things. I know I'm ready. Do you know you're ready? I pray today that you know without any doubt in your heart, your mind, you are ready, ready, ready. Life is uncertain. Life is nebulous. No one has a promise for tomorrow. But I don't need a promise for tomorrow. I've got Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm not the God of the dead. What was Jesus saying when he said that? Even though these men died physically, he was saying, they're still alive. For he that believeth in me, though he were dead, shall never die spiritual application. I'll see you tomorrow. Have a great evening. Amen. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.